In Luke chapter 18, verse 18, the Bible says this. Now a certain ruler asked him, asked Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these have I kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when he heard this, the Bible said he became very, very sorrowful because he was very rich. This morning's message <clears throat> is entitled Just One Thing. Just One Thing. How sad it would be for me or you if we come down to the very end of our life and we lived it the best we thought we could and we missed it, we missed heaven just by one little thing. Just one thing that would keep us out of heaven. Just one thing that would keep me from having a real relationship with Christ. Just one thing, how sad and foolish on my part would it be if I allow one thing to keep me from my eternal home in heaven? With all the redeemed saints of God from all generations, seeing and being a part of, of the multitudes and multitudes that has come from it, time past, my goodness, the number of countless people that I've read about, talked about, thought about, preached about, the angelic choirs, the prophets, Old Testament prophets, the apostles, the kingdom of glory in all of its magnificence and above it all, Jesus Christ. And I let one little thing keep me for being a participant of that. How sad. During Jesus' earthly ministry, one day he was approached by this young man Luke says he was a ruler. And then it goes on to describe him as a rich, young ruler. I'm sure there's some young ladies in this room that would like to meet him. Rich, young, and powerful. One has to assume that he didn't get rich by being lazy. He was no doubt a young man that was a visionary, a young man that had aggressiveness about his life, a young man that planned and succeeded, a young man that had some kind of business savvy about him. He was able to grow his wealth in a competitive market. He was able to do what most people couldn't do. Much could be said in regard to the credit of this young businessman. He knew how to make money. He was rich, he was young, he was youthful. Another thing, qualities I see about him was he was respectful. His greeting to Jesus was good teacher. He recognized Jesus as being good. He saw in Jesus a goodness that he probably didn't see in very many people in his line of work, in his world. He saw in Jesus a spiritual revelation that this man come from God. This man had a voice from God. He recognized that Jesus was good, that he was a teacher, that he was a man of God, a prophet of God. He acknowledged that he needed to be taught by this good teacher. For he said, tell me how I can obtain eternal life. There's a lot of good traits that you quickly see about this young man. You can't fault him in those things. He's not lazy. He's not a good for nothing. He's not somebody that's wasted his life. He's a man that purpose, a man with vision, a man with business savvy, a man that is, uh, recognizes good qualities in people, a man that was respectful to a prophet of God, a man of God. All of this is good. It's quite different from some of the people you see today, right? Quite different from the ladies on The View. 
One of them commented this week, Joy Behar commented this week that because Vice President Pence felt like God had spoken to him that he had mental sickness. Wow. She doesn't believe that God can speak to you. Well, you know, she's convicting herself because the Bible says, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and none other will they follow. So he evidently speaks, so she must be in the wrong fold. Christianity is under attack. His voice one day will thunder from the heavens and believe me, they will hear him. Even the dead will hear him and come up out of the grave. He speaks. He says what he wants to say. He'll do what he wants to do. He's God Almighty. The sad part about that is the ABC network never rebuked her and called her on the carpet for that. And sadly, the liberal media never called her out for crossing the line. In these last days, Jesus said, you'll be hated for my sake. I'm glad I got a vice president that believes that Jesus Christ can speak into his heart and the word of God is real and alive. Hallelujah. I'm glad he doesn't mind quoting the scripture. I'm glad he doesn't mind standing up for family values. I'm glad he doesn't mind lifting up the name of Jesus and praying and believing that God is talking to him. Thank God we've needed that for a long time in America. We need some leaders that will hear the voice of God and know that God is speaking to them. One day the whole world's going to hear his voice. People wondering this morning, what in the world's wrong with America? Let me tell you, when we're entertained by people that like I've just mentioned to you and the influence that they exert on, the, on us or on people, what kind of expectation do you have of a culture? What do you expect if they're teaching you against the Christianity and against the moral values? This rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the question every human being on planet earth needs to ask. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to make heaven my home? What must I do to avoid hell and an eternity without Christ? What an awful thing it would be for us to live a number of years on this earth and go into a Christless eternity of darkness and hell, fire and brimstone. Dear God of heaven, let us open the book one more time and realize that there's only two places we're going, either to heaven or either to hell. It's time somebody asked the question, what can, must I do to inherit eternal life? What will it cost me to go to heaven? I wanna go to heaven, how about you? I want to make heaven my home. That's the question we need to ask. What can I do to be saved? Jesus replied, why call you me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. Can I just tell you this morning, God is a good God. Amen. He's not out to get you. He doesn't have, uh, he doesn't have a, a group of people that's trying to knock you off. He doesn't have angels that's after you, trying to bump you on the head, knock you out every time, time you make a mistake. I want to tell you, the goodness of God reaches you, loves you, that mercies of God surround you. God is a good God. If he wasn't good, we wouldn't still be here. He loves you more than you can even know about. He's not a mean God. He doesn't have judgment against you. That's not his plan at all. I've had people ask me, well, if God is so good, why would he send me to hell? He won't. That's your choice if you want to go there. He's given you heaven. You have to make that choice. God loves you. God cares about you. God's mercy is for you. God is a good God. He was good this morning. He'll be good tonight. He'll be good in the morning. He'll be good the next day. Listen to me, friend. God is a good God. Do I hear it? Amen. Not just one time, not just two times. He's good every day of your life. Somebody said, well, I hear preachers lambast and they say this, I, they say that. Well, let me tell you, the word of God just says the goodness of God leads you to repentance. God loves you this morning. He loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross in your place so you could go to heaven. Don't turn that down. 
He gave you the greatest gift that any human being could ever give or, or have, and that is Jesus. Good. God is good. And Jesus said to him, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. If the families in America are tired of what's happening in America, if we'll all settle down and stop and get our families back around the altar and let the Ten Commandments be the guide of our nation and our homes and our families, you won't see the hell and the misery that's going on in the world right now. It's not God's fault what's happening. It's our fault. The Bible said any nation that goes back on the laws of God will be turned into hell. The reason we have the hell and the misery and the violence and the hate that's going on in America right now, is we've turned our back on God. We've forsaken the laws of God. We don't wanna do the commandments of God. We walked away from God. And if you walk away from God, what else do you have left? The enemy comes in, the darkness comes in, the evil comes in, hell moves in, and then you have all the chaos. Don't blame God for what's happening, it's our fault. If the families are tired of what's happening, then if we'll come back to God, God can heal us. You know the commandments, he said, that's the starting place for all of our families in all of America. This week in Florida, a troubled 19 year old young man went to the Florida school, as you well know murdered 17 people and injured 15 more. Once again, our nation is shocked and in a state of grief. For 17 families, life will never be the same. The pain they feel, the hurt they're going through this very moment, no parent should ever have to endure. My heart goes out to those precious people our thoughts, our prayers, our love is sent to them. This is a tragedy that has happened to our nation time and time again. It's not the first time, and sadly, it probably won't be the last. We live in a society that has lost its way. Our culture is one of divisiveness, hate, and violence. When tragedies happen, the same groups come out and pull their same argument and stand across from one another, flailing their arms and frothing at the mouth and dividing the nation even more. America's problem is a spiritual problem. America's problem is a heart problem. If we don't have a heart change, the culture is not going to change. If we don't get God in our hearts, then we won't have peace in our nation. If you feed kids a steady diet of violence and hate and killing and raise them undisciplined and allowed to do whatever they wanna do when they wanna do it, then believe me, you'll see the results played out just like you have. The hell that we're witnessing is the result of our beloved nation walking away from God. A parent, listen to me parents, America needs parents that will stand up again and be the parents of homes and families. We need to bring our kids around us. We need to have supper tables again, supper times again. We need to have prayer and devotion again. We need to have the family altar again. We need to get our kids under our arms and take them to church again. Do I hear it, amen? We need to burn some video games and we need to get rid of some lyrics and rock music and, and all the filth and all the violence and all the hate that, that is spewed out of those. It's time for us to have a spiritual house arranging in America. That's the only way you're going to solve the problem. Our schools have become killing fields. Our schools have become drug scenes. Our schools have become war zones of erratic, uncontrollable behavioral problems. 
We have a generation that's been raised on bloody video games, bloody murdering and raping movies that entertain them. This generation has been conditioned and desensitized in their emotions. They don't have any compassion for another man or woman or boy or girl. You become what you feed your mind on. The lyrics of the songs of this generation that it's listening to is the most vulgar and evil and satanic inspired in its origin. The opposite would be true if we had wholesome, decent gospel message and truth feeding into the spirit and the mind of these young people. You say, Pastor, nobody's interested in all of that. Then they're going grieving and killing and hurting and destruction. No one wants to change the music industry. No one wants to change Hollywood. No one wants to change those kinds of things. Then we'll go on having the same things that we've been having. No one wants to change 11, 12 year old boy from watching bloody video games and killing people and murdering people on a video machine for hours a day. Then expect him to go out and act normal. Dear God, what are you expecting? It's time for us to make some clear cut decision. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. We need to plead the blood of Jesus Christ over every one of our kids every morning before you take them to school. We need to pray the blessings of God, glory over them. I love my kids and I love my grandkids. I appreciate Jamie and Kim and I appreciate Kevin for trying to raise their kids right. They're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But I appreciate them praying over them, giving them counsel and wisdom in their lives. Because if you don't do it, believe me, it won't come from somewhere else. But I think this is a funny story. Kevin pulled up to the school many years ago and we are gonna let both of his boys out. And before he let them out, they'd always have a little prayer and then say, oh, Kevin say, okay, what are we, what are we today? And there's, their response is, we're mighty men of God. Well, that morning, Dawson wasn't feeling the best in the world and Kevin finished whatever he's doing and said, okay, what are we? And Landon said, we're mighty men of God. And Dawson didn't say anything. Kevin said, Dawson? He said, I'm just an old biscuit head. <laughs> We need to pour into our kids. Listen, friend, our kids need some training. They need discipline. They need spiritual guidance. They need help. Our kids are wandering around in a wilderness and a maze of, of evil and satanic influence. Dear God, we need a spiritual renewal and a spiritual revival in America. We need the churches to be full of repentant heart. We need families to have altar time again, family time again. We need to build the family stronger. That's the only way you're gonna change this situation. All over America, the churches ought to be full this morning. All over America, the altars are to be full when the preachers give the altar calls, and some of them won't even do that. A cry of repentance ought to go up from the nation of America, crying out, God save us, God heal us, God help us. Standing across the street from one another, cursing and swearing and, and uh, belittling one another is not going to solve the problems of this world. Somebody need to get a hold of the hand of God and reach down and take a hold of the hand of the people. Somebody's heart need to be tender and touched by the Holy Spirit of God. We need a move of God. And yet I heard some of them say, don't tell us your thoughts and prayers are with us. We don't want to hear that. Jesus said, keep the commandments. The young man replied, I've done that. I've been doing that all of my life since I was a little boy. Now, I've got one answer for that. I've got one word about that. If that young man is true, and apparently what he said was true, he is of high moral character. He's not just some loose living, anything goes, rebellious, religious hypocrite. He's been serious about his life. He's kept the commandments. He's deliberate with his decisions. He's disciplined when it comes to the following of the law. 
But Jesus looked at him and said, you have, haven't you? But you still lack one thing. Just one. One more step. One more decision. One more act on your part. You still lack one thing. Everybody say, just one thing. Just one thing. Jesus knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. I couldn't hide anything from God if I wanted to, and you couldn't either. He knew you before you opened your eyes this morning. And if you're trying to hide something, just forget it. He already knows it. Do I hear it? Amen. And don't be thinking about somebody else. You just think about yourself. Some of you are sitting here right now. I'm glad God knows that old boy. Well, God knows you too. How many know that the Bible says there's not one of us perfect? No, not one. All of us have gone astray. All of us are like sheep. We've wandered away. But let us return to the very bishop of our soul. The scripture encourages us. You just like one thing. He knows me. He knows what's in my heart. He knows what I think. He knows how I act. He knows me. In church, I stand before you this morning and I'm as honest. I want to make heaven my home. And I want you to as well. So I don't preach this message as one condemning anybody. I just want you to know the Lord said this is what for me to preach this morning. And it applies to me just like it applies to you. One thing you like, sell everything you have and distribute it, give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Give it all up. Follow me in every part of your life. Don't hold on to anything. Surrender everything you have, all your fame, all your fortune, all your reputation, all your bank account. Give it all to me. Lay it all down. If you want to have eternal life, give it all. Now you look at me this morning and you probably are saying, man, let's consider this. He's probably a multimillionaire. And the Lord is asking him to literally give up everything. And I'm going to ask you before you get too critical of this young man, what would you do? What would be your decision? The Bible says that Jesus was asking him to do that. And I, and I have a thought. You remember when God asked Abraham to take his son Isaac, his only son Isaac, take him up on Mount Moriah and there offer him as a sacrifice? And so Abraham responded, Lord, I'll do that. He carried him up on top of the mountain, laid him down on the sacrifice, uh, as a sacrifice on the altar and was about to slay his own son. And the Bible said this, Abraham believed that God was absolutely able to raise that boy back up if that's what he wanted, needed to do. He was willing to give it all. But you know what happened? The Lord stopped him. The angel of God stopped Abraham and Abraham didn't, didn't do that. But there was a ram had his horns caught in the thicket and the angel said, don't do your son any harm. So I use that as an illustration this morning. I'm wondering if, if the young man had said, all right, I'm willing to do it. He might not even had to do it in him. Do you follow me? I don't know that, but I don't know it wouldn't have happened. My point is, if that's what it requires, I still want to go to heaven. How about you? Amen. I mean, would you trade your riches for heaven? Would you trade all your wealth? Do you want to keep all of that and live just a few hours here on the earth and then go to hell? Do you just want your heaven to be right here, right now with your possessions? Do you know that what you possess right now, somebody else is going to possess in just a little while? You can work hard, you can save money, you can build it all up and somebody else is gonna get it. And most of the time it'll be people that don't know how to appreciate it. He said, boy, I'm gonna save all this for my kids and my grandkids. They didn't work hard for it. They'll sell it all, take it to the garage sale. No, I'm teasing. They will take a cruise around the world but you wouldn't because you're saving it all up. 
Come on, you're supposed to smile this morning. I'm just trying to tell you, riches don't last long because life here don't last long. What lasts forever is over there. We get this so twisted around. We think that, man, I can be rich, I can have all this, but it only lasts for a few hours, few years, and then it's all gone, goes up in smoke. You don't take it with you. Do I hear it, amen? The Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? So close to heaven, you're right at the door. One more step, one more decision, one little thing, and you can't do it. So close, just one more thing. Would you stand with me, please? Just one thing. Say it out loud, just one thing. Just one thing. Now, here's the sad part. This is the sad part. The Bible says, this is what it said, that young ruler, that rich young man turned away and went away sorrowful because he was very rich. Listen to me quickly. He turned Jesus down on his offer. He refused to take the last step. He kept the commandments, he said. He lived a good moral upstanding life. He was highly respected, highly successful, but the very step that he didn't take was the one that kept him from going to heaven. Just one thing and he was not willing to do it. I don't know what the one thing is in your life, but whatever that one thing is, I want you to give it to God. Don't make the mistake of going away sorrowful. Don't make the mistake of saying, God, I can't do that. I can't give that up. It'll be worth it all when you see Jesus. It'll be worth it all when you step through the gates of pearl on streets of gold in a place called heaven. Just one thing. Would you bow your head with me? Lord, I thank you this morning that you have spoken to our hearts. This is the message for our generation. This is a message that we need to hear and respond to. And I pray, oh God, that every one of us would be sober in our thinking, that every one of us would be listening to your voice of the Holy Spirit, and we would act in wisdom. And we would say, Lord, whatever you require, I want to do it. Whatever it takes for me to go to heaven, I wanna be willing to take that step to make heaven my home. In Christ's name, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder how many of you in this room right now would just slip your hand up and drop it back down and by that be saying, pastor, would you pray for me? Preacher, would you pray for me? I need help with my life. I wanna make heaven my home, but I have some things I probably need to take care of. Quickly, would you slip your hand up, drop it back down. Yes, 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 yes. Lord, thank you for these very special people this morning. Thank you that you're speaking and we're listening. And Lord, this morning, I just pray that you would bless each person here. Make, help us make the right choice, the right decisions. Help us, Lord, not to turn away from you, but to turn to you. Bring healing over our nation. Bring help into our families and into this audience and into every person here. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for watching this video. And I want to do this for you today. I want you to join me and just say the, the prayer of the sinner. And I hope that you will let Jesus Christ come into your heart and change your life. God's got a good plan for your life. All you need to do is invite him in. And the Bible said he'll come in and live inside of you. So pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I recognize that I am a sinner, that God loves me, and that God wants to save me. So I repent of my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and has come to save me. I accept him right now as my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name, and I thank you, God, for saving my life. Amen.
God bless you, my friend, and may the Lord bless you and keep you always in his love.